The sun just went into the 2-1, and so it, it's given me some opportunity to reflect on yin, on what it means to be yin. And it's interesting because, you know, yin and yang are so, or yang, yan, are so uh, overloaded. You know, we usually say uh, yin and yang, but I believe it's pronounced more like yin and yan. In any case, these are such overloaded signifiers. Um, we have everything from signifiers of sexuation, you know, male and female, to, um, you know, basically any general opposite, kind of like how Carl Jung begins Mysterium Conjunctionis, where he, um, he lists all of the famous opposites of the alchemists. You know, heaven and earth, uh, which would be, of course, from the, the, the Chinese trigrams, where the trigram for yang is heaven and yin is earth. Um, but also, you know, fixed and mutable, or, you know, good and evil, inferior, superior, superior or inferior, you know, all these different versions of it. Uh, the, the quality metaphor, the visual metaphor, the, you know, the, the, the different ways that we talk about distinction. And so as we, you know, go into the first line of gate two, which of course is all six yin lines, it's the most yin hexagram, that's the beginning of the yin. Um, what is it, you know, to be yin? And interestingly, I think um, there's a lot of different versions of this because it's so overloaded, it's difficult, right? Rick Tarnas calls James Hillman the, uh, because he has sun and moon conjunct in Aries, he interprets this as the, the hero for the lunar, sort of a lunar hero, or like the solar hero of the lunar, the champion of the lunar. So the champion of the yin, who themselves are not yin, but are championing the yin as yang. And that kind of reminds me of, you know, Ra saying he was double yang, um, and being double yang, but all the double yang are being phased out. I had to wonder because Ra is, although he's possibly FM type code in objective personality, but I had to wonder if there's a correlation between yin and yang as well in the, the crystals and the combinations of the crystals. The fact that you have four possible permutations, you have double yang, double yin, or yin yang, or yang yin. And I was wondering if there is some sort of correlation between that and between the gendered function modalities and objective personality. My hunch is that there's not, that there's not, but I was just curious about that because we have the type codes MM, FM, MF, and FF. For instance, I am MF because I'm very masculine physically and in the physical world, but I am feminine in how I, how I you know, relate to others. And what qualities and attributes you apply to masculine and feminine in this context say more about you than about the, you know, the essence of masculinity and femininity. But that is kind of what I'm asking is, you know, the essence of yin, you know, even in spite of, you know, anti-essentialism. So for those who aren't familiar with anti-essentialism, it kind of came around with deconstruction and with this idea of deconstructing all sorts of um, essentials, which were really hiding privilege and were hiding all sorts of, uh, of things, you know, and, you know, I, I'm not an essentialist. I'm not talking about like the true essence of man or the true essence of woman, I, you know, the, especially when it comes to like, Plato, like a certain reading of Plato of unchanging essences, which itself is only one very limited reading of Plato. There are many other readings of Plato, each with their own limitations, right? I mean, there's like 10 readings of Plato that are enumerated at the beginning of Badu's translation slash reimagining of Plato's Republic, um, just as an example. So essences are just one understanding. You know, uh, Rick Tarnas also does a great job of explaining the different possible readings of Plato, um, not as unchanging essences, but as just, you know, invisible, the invisible, kind of like that Chesterton, um, that Chesterton essay about the, uh, the fundamental belief or the fundamental assertion being that of the visible against the invisible. And, you know, I'm with Chesterton in that the sort of fundamental way of being is, is sort of anti-materialist. But wait a minute, doesn't this sound then to be 
completely yang, right? Because if we equate the material with the yin, then isn't anti-materialism, you know, anti-yang? I mean, sorry, isn't that being yang? Isn't that anti-yin? Well, no, it's not. It's not because the materialist stance is actually the stance of superiority of the mind over the material. And the spiritualist stance that I'm describing is actually the stance of, uh, it's not exactly spiritualist even as much as it's soulist, but there's no real word for that, right? Because isms don't really, don't, don't work so well when it comes to, uh, <laughs> to the yin, because it's such a, a comparison-oriented thing. I mean, I almost feel like to really get at the difference in the yin and the yin, we have to actually go to Bergson's Introduction to Metaphysics. Um, although, again, it's difficult because yang and yin are such overdetermined signifiers that the primary distinction Bergson makes in Introduction to Metaphysics could equally be related to, for instance, the difference between logical versus abstract circuitry, uh, or even ver collective versus individual circuitry. So there are many oppositions that we can kind of relate, and none of them are really identical. You know, there's, a, there's this inborn desire, I think, of the mind to collapse difference. And that's something Hillman points out when he talks about these esoteric systems that talk about the four seasons relating to the four humors and the four cardinal directions and the four apostles and the four this and the four that. And he says, look, not all fours are the same. Just because they're, they're systems of four does not mean we should erase the differences between all of these different fours. And I think it's the same thing here. There's a difference between the logical and the abstract that's very different than the difference between the collective versus the individual circuitry, you know, taking collective in general, both logic and abstract, and what they are, how they are different from individual circuitry. And all of these are fundamentally different, um, you know, than the difference between yin and yang in terms of yin knowledge, form knowledge versus yang knowledge, right? And, and, and you know, what's a yang system? What is a mental system? Um, you know, Buddhism is often accused of being a mental system, although there are so many different aspects of Buddhism that I, I would probably say the D.T. Suzuki school of Buddhism, the one that Brian, uh, what's his name? Um, there's a Zen at War. It's a, it's a fantastic book. Uh, let me look it up here. Yeah, here it is. Brian Victoria. Yeah. And, um, and so, you know, we, there are all sorts of mental systems, and I don't mean to conflate, you know, these different distinctions. But I do think it, it's at least relevant to bring up Bergson's distinction, because Bergson, for those who need a little context, was like the most famous philosopher in the world until he had a public debate with Einstein that he lost, and some other things happened, but that was kind of a nail in the coffin, and, you know, has fallen into disrepute, right? So Bergson is not renowned as much and is sort of frowned upon. I mean, some people still use Bergson, right? So Deleuze used Bergson extensively, and some Deleuzeans acknowledge the Bergsonian influence. Other Deleuzeans, like like Levy Bryant, or, or Levi, I believe is how his, he was named, but he likes Levy because it makes him sound more European. Um, he, uh, you know, he's a materialist. He's like an eliminative materialist who, who it kind of radically asserts the superiority of the mind over matter, similar to Reza Negarastani and a lot of neo-rationalists. Um, you know, a lot of contemporary philosophers are talking about like weaponizing thought and weaponizing the labor of thought and generalized artificial intelligence and what it means to deploy thought, you know, and so on, all this stuff. And they're all like fancy code words for, yay, isn't my mind great at making decisions? Look how good my mind is at making decisions, right? and how does the mind make the best decisions and so on. And they come to these really absurd sort of philosophical stances, some of which are correctly dismantled by Rick Tarnas, like in Cosmos and Psyche and in his essay, um, Two Suitors, a Parable, and uh, in, his, in his work kind of on participatory epistemology and so on, because Rick Tarnas correctly um, destroys the kind of Ray Brassier notion that because the eventual heat death of the universe will render every one who ever lived dead and all traces of all information will be erased and so on. And because of this, life is meaningless. Well, Tarnas has a really good response to it. Uh, in short, 
that um, the greatest hubris is actually the human putting themselves at the, the sort of center of meaning, the, the soul creators of meaning and the soul arbiters of truth and purpose and so on. So, you know, and I find Tarnas's work to be somewhat compatible with human design, except to the point I see, I see him as kind of mutative adjacent in some sense. I've, I've met Tarnas a number of times. Uh, I've done human design readings for his daughter and her husband, who I actually knew independently before, um, before they were married just by, you know, reputation and through online correspondence. Um, but, you know, not really personally per se, but I've met them in, in, in real life many times and, and have spent actually many hours in, in conversation. And what I found is, yeah, they're, they're not, they're, you know, like, I don't necessarily think that Tarnas takes, or that, I don't think that either Tarnas, because now there are two scholars with the last name Tarnas, of course, that, that either Tarnas takes the next step beyond the global cycles in, into the research and areas that human design has uncovered, which is the most mutative and cutting edge and experimental research uh, that there is. And I don't think they've been able to do that because they've, there's still this sort of weight of the scholarly and weight of the seven-centered um, that is kind of holding them back of, of the seven-centered world and the study of the seven-centered world. Um, but, you know, this nine-centered reality is upon us, and I do think there are inklings of that in, in both Tarnas's work, um, you know, really. I, I've, I've seen little inklings of it. Uh, for Becca's work, I haven't seen as much, but I'm also not as familiar with her work. I've, I mean, I've seen a number of her lectures. And I have found with her lectures, I have not necessarily... You know, there's still a yang bent to it. There's still a mastery of the material using the mind and a very penta demonstration of that mastery to other pentas and a very like you know it's still within the system and so in some sense there is mutation i mean cosmos and psyche is a mutative work but it's not it's it stops short in the same way hillman stopped short and in the same way that Hillman and Tarnas were never able to, to access the true mutative potential of Jung. Um, and I believe that having uh, listened to many, many lectures from, from Rick Tarnas, having spent much time with him. And, um, but, you know, I, I think that there is that mutative potential. I think it helps that Rick Tarnas is a big LSD advocate. And, you know, Groff is another one who's developed maybe what is a nine-centered system to some degree, but is still mired in a lot of seven-centered um, stuff. Uh, you know, Stanislav Groff. But, but I think it helps that, and obviously Tarnas is mutative in the sense that, you know, hanging out with John Cleese, Monty Python, they're so mutative. I mean, you see mutative people. I mean, I see mutative people around, even if they're not into human design. And you see that depending on really their their ability to get it you know their fractal line really will you know will they sometimes they're just right one level or two levels removed by the game of telephone like as an example would be um human design never reached rick tarnas right it never reached him despite the fact that i've shared physical space a matter of feet apart from him for you know, multiple days worth of hours if we accumulated it all together. But the fact that I've spent a certain number of hours in the same room as somebody or even in conversation with that person is no guarantee that person's going to get human design from me. Because they only get it from me if they pull it out from me. And if I'm at an astrology conference, the last thing I'm talking about to astrologers is human design, unless it comes up. I'm a generator, you know. And a lot of times it will come up because I have, you know, reputation, that, so then it'll, it will come up. Okay, so... But going back to Bergson, so I definitely don't want to conflate Bergson's distinctions that he lays out in the 1903 uh, Introduction to Metaphysics. I don't want to conflate them with the difference between the collective logical and collective abstract, or between the collective in general and the individual, or even between yin and yang. But I do want to at least refer to them because I think that there is a, there is a way that the yin as a signifier at least, somewhat refers to the same systems that are referred to by Deleuze and Guattari that they detect 
you know, because the yin is sort of, I don't want to conflate the yin with the unconscious. I don't even necessarily want to use the word unconscious always. I mean, I call the design the unconscious, but I have a friend um, who said he really can't stand the use of the term unconscious for the design. Why not just call it the design? So I don't want to conflate the design with the yin entirely, although it does seem to me that that is kind of what it is. Um, but it's a lot of things, right? And so this is what's so interesting is how do we describe something so general, you know, as this property of yin, right? Especially on this day of yin. What does it mean to be yin? And, you know, is the design yin and the personality is yang? I guess in some sense, yeah. In some sense, that is true, right? Like the yang, the personality, the spirit, we could say. And then the design is soul. So when James Hillman, in his essay on spirit and soul, called Peaks and Veils, talks about the distinctions between spirit and soul, in some sense, he is talking about yang and yin. And he is being a champion for what Tarnas casts as the solar versus the lunar, where the solar is the spiritual and the lunar is of the soul, S-O-U-L, right? So there, you can see how these distinctions have partial overlap and partial, you know, because language is always going to be a many-to-many -many mapping. And many words can mean the same thing. And many many in one word can mean many things right and so because of this you know we're going to have james hillman and his so we're going to have bergson in 1903 introduction to metaphysics really being a champion for what he calls the absolute which is something like uh the subjective inner experience of things truly as they are which sounds kind of like living your design you know like actually being awake and experiencing things in their uniqueness in their differentiation as an awake being, which sounds kind of like being fully embodied in yin. Uh, and yet we're fraught with a lot of perils here because the myth of presence itself, which is one of the feelings of being embodied, gives us this myth of presence, is itself, you know, the yang that is deconstructed, for instance, by Jacques Derrida. Um, with his work on presence. And in fact, if we get deep into human design and we look at the base theory parts of it, where, for instance, the fifth base is space, and what it gives the illusion of is the illusion of space and the illusion of the presence in space, we see that it's not so clear to get to the end. Because to be embodied and to be fully present in your body, as they do with mindfulness meditation, can be a very yang thing. It can be a very yang thing to be using your mind in such a way. So what it really comes down to is how the mind is kind of meant to be used, how it's designed to be used. So the design is sort of the yin of it, and we see that even the yang has a design. It has a design that allows it to, to operate, um, at least in our current use of the term. Now, as we'll see, there are very many different uses of the terms yin and yang, so I'm just kind of walking through some of them. Okay, let's read Bergson, and then I'm gonna move on to Barry Long's descriptions of yin and yang. Let's see. Okay, Bergson introduction to metaphysics. All right, so this is the beginning of introduction to metaphysics from Henri Bergson. Maybe sometime I'll read more of this, but um, I'm just gonna read the first little bit. A comparison of the definitions of metaphysics and the various conceptions of the absolute leads to the discovery that philosophers, in spite of their apparent divergencies, agree in distinguishing two profoundly different ways of knowing a thing. The first implies that we move round the object, the second that we enter into it. The first depends on the point of view at which we are placed and on the symbols by which we express ourselves. The second neither depends on a point of view nor relies on any symbol. The first kind of knowledge may be said to stop at the relative, the second in those cases where it is possible to attain the absolute. So again, this first distinction, I mean, can we say that the yin is the absolute and that the yang is the relative? Not really, but there is a sense in which the mind is constantly going to work in the world of comparison. See, but again, there's all sorts of conflation here because, you know, Ra will, for instance, talk about individual circuitry and how comparison to others, if you have individual circuitry, is such a poisonous thing. And so here it almost seems as if the absolute is the individual, which is a deeply personal subjective experience. Right? Whereas the relative that, that Bergson is talking about is a way of knowing things only through comparison to other things. That almost sounds like a logical way of knowing things. 
But then it could also be the logical versus the abstract, because the abstract or the experiential is always uniquely singular, right? It's singular, it's not repeated, and so it's what's singular in the experience. So, okay, so anyway, let me go on a little more. Consider, for example, the movement of an object in space. My perception of the motion will vary with the point of view, moving or stationary from which I observe it. My expression of it will vary with the system of axes or the points of reference to which I relate it, that is, with the symbols by which I translate it. For this double reason, I call such motion relative. In the one case, as in the other, I am placed outside the object itself. But when I speak of an absolute movement, I am attributing to the object an interior and, so to speak, states of mind. I also imply that I am in sympathy with those states, and that I insert myself in them by an effort of, imagin of imagination. Then, according to the ob as the object is moving or stationary, according as it adopts one movement or another, what I experience will vary, and what I experience will depend neither on the point of view I may take up in regard to the object, since I am inside the object itself, nor on the symbols by which I may translate the motion, since I have rejected all translations, in order to possess the original. In short, I shall no longer grasp the movement from without, remaining where I am, but from where it is, from within, as it is in itself. I shall possess an absolute. Okay, so I mean, I've, and I've read parts of this before, um, and you know, I, I do want to go on because he, he talks about how the absolute can be synonymous with perfection, and how the absolute can be synonymous with the infinite, and also what it is to have intuition, uh, you know, and to use intuition. Um, you know, and, and I think this is actually a more fundamental text for my understanding of human design. I mean, this is one of my foundational texts. I love Berg's an Introduction to Metaphysics. And to me, one of the, one of the foundations is actually going to be, you know, that, that this actually lays the groundwork for what I consider my undertaking in human design to be, which is a metaphysical research program. Um, you know, and, and so it is... But, you know, when Bergson talks about it, he says that metaphysics is the science which claims to dispense with symbols. It's a reality that we seize from within by intuition. And it's not by analysis. It is our own personality, and it's flowing through time, our self which endures. So, you know, it's really, an, it's an interesting, I mean, and it's so beautifully written too. He says, beneath these sharply cut crystals in this frozen, frozen surface, a continuous flux, which is not, there is a continuous flux, which is not comparable to any flux I've ever seen. There is a succession of states, each of which announces that which follows and contains that which precedes it. This inner life may be compared to the unrolling of a coil, for there is no living being who does not feel himself gradually to the end of his roll, and to live is to grow old, but it may just as well be compared to a continued rolling up, like that of a thread on a ball. For our past follows us, it swells incessantly with the present that it picks up on its way, and consciousness means memory. But actually it is neither an unrolling nor a rolling up, for these two similes evoke the idea of lines and surfaces whose parts are homogeneous and superposable on one another. No, now there are no two identical moments in the life of the same conscious being. Take the simplest sensation, suppose it constant, absorb it in the entire personality. The consciousness which will accompany this sensation cannot remain identical with itself for two consecutive moments, because the second moment always contains, over and above the first, the memory that the first has bequeathed to it. A consciousness which could experience two identical moments would be a consciousness without memory. It would die and be born again continually. In what other way could one represent unconsciousness? Interesting question. Yeah, so I mean, I, I love this work. This is a really interesting one. But, um, but you know, okay, so on the one hand, I guess Yin could be said, you know, because Bergson, to me, when he's getting to the absolute essences of things, he is getting to their, their Yin property, which is their distinction, their differentiation in some sense. Now, can we say that Yin is differentiation? Well, we can say that you know, the yin is the actual um, form that obeys a certain laws of form, and lo you know, like even in the Spencer Brown's idea of laws of form, but also um, laws of form in the Proustian sense of psychic laws. So there is a psychic component of yin as well, 
There's a psychic yin as well. It's not that the entire psyche is yang. In fact, psyche means soul, and so in some sense the psyche is yin, and it is the spirited mind that is existing within a psychic space that is the sort of yang element. Okay, so now I want to just do a brief... Um, I'm, I'm going to just talk briefly about Barry Long, or uh, just do a little bit of an overview of him. I'm not a huge fan of his work, particularly because he apparently has some homophobic um, statements and so on. But um, let's see. So Barry Long was born and raised in Australia, had little formal education. In the 20s, he was the editor of a Sydney Sunday paper called The Truth, and later press secretary. And um, in his early 30s, he began to experience disillusionment with material life. In 1964, he went to India. He had a spiritual crisis, mystical, self-described mystic death. Um, he had a four years of transcendental realization and so on. Leaving India, he moved and uh, lived in Highgate. and was a sub-editor in Fleet Street and so on. Um, so I have some problems with his, with his work, you know, he says, he stated that he was a tantric master and that unhappiness arises because man and woman have forgotten how to love each other. And he has the audio cassette, making love, sexual love the divine way. I mean, I, I hate stuff like this. I hate these kind of titles. Uh, I also, looking at his teachings, they look really terrible when I see descriptions of his teachings. Like, uh, this is from his Wikipedia, uh, you know, we follow the, to follow the way of truth includes constant vigilance to observe one's thoughts, emotions, and actions. Meditation to still the mind and connect with life. Um, feeling the well-being in the body. Being without, without thought. Just being in, in the moment without thought. And then getting your life right. Taking action in those areas in your life which disturb you because something is wrong. Um, yeah. Yeah, so I don't know. I really don't... The primary, this is how he describes it, his primary spiritual practice is self-denial, giving, and honesty, practiced over a long period out of an inner perception of rightness and goodness. Yeah, see, this is like mind crap. This is total mind crap, you know, giving and honesty through inner perception of rightness and goodness. I mean, the perception, I mean, yeah, it's like, so that part of it I don't like. But then he does have you know, um, descriptions of yin and yang. So let me go, okay. And I, I think I'll have to do a video on this um, another time. I'm gonna do it on the myth, of, the myth of Draco, but chapter 17 of The Origin of Man in the Universe, he describes yin and yang, and it's really nice. I'm gonna do a little excerpt, and then I wanna try to... Okay. So he goes... Um, Draco is a dragon or serpent. Its head is yang and its tail is yin. The profound cosmic principle of yang and yin is the mythical bridge between outer and inner. So here he's equating yin as the entire inner world, which is so interesting. And yang is the entire outer world. I mean, it's such a different way of thinking of that, you know, because usually we think of yin as the material that's being penetrated by the spiritually, the spiritual wind, so to speak. Interesting, but he goes, Yang is the, is the behind the apparent external created by our looking out consciously into the unconscious, streaming down onto the surface of the earth. Yin is behind the unconscious within. Together they represent the extent of the unconscious reality which can only be sensed through myth. Myth alone transcends all conscious parameters. Yang, the serpent's head, is all eyes, a huge platform of celestial perception. From this vantage point in deepest space, a score of light years beyond the solar system, the Yang principle of Draco presides over time and events which on Earth are represented by life and death, the, the dynamic between terrestrial evolu evolution. From the Earth's viewpoint, Draco's tail, Yin, ends deep in the unconscious of the human mind, beyond the psyche, within the mind of the Earth, the mind of the one Earth spirit. Between the head and space and the tail within is the serpent's body. This is man and all the species, both living and dead. Yang is responsible for the Earth's evolution as an intrinsic part of the whole evolving universe. From its towering Draco position, it surveys the universe and keeps Yin informed. Yin is responsible for seeing that the correlating evolutionary changes occur within the terrestrial mind. 
For humanity, as distinct from other life forms, which may inhabit other planets or star systems, well, of course, that's very against human design, which says there are no other life forms in other planets or star systems. But in any case, for humanity, Yang surveys the universe relevant to sense perception, also seeing far beyond sense perceptive evolution into galactic factors that even our creator sun is unable to perceive. Yang conveys to Yin the state of the galaxy as it affects the terrestrial mind in considerably more profound ways than we can ever be aware of. Well, unless you study rave cosmology, right? The character of Yang and Yin is will. Yang is Draco's head is the will in the universe. Yin is the tail is the will in terrestrial mind. I mean, how similar to human design is this? That there's a personality crystal sheath, which is the Yang principle. It's not really described as willpower or as will, for, but it is sort of. But then Yin as the terrestrial mind. Very interesting, you know, because again, the Yin is the design crystal bundle in the uh, Earth's mantle, right? So, okay. However, Yang and Yin are not just a closed circuit Draco to Earth polarity. The Yang-Yin Earth connection is only one of many comparable meridians linking numerous suns in their orbital matter to form a gigantic cosmic spiritual field, the Draconic Transverse. Within this vast evolutionary system, the outer must be kept in unison and harmony with the inner. Neither must get ahead nor behind. Yang and Yin are the principle, the will, in matter and mind, ensuring this. So he here describes Yang as matter and Yin as mind. Yin is the psychic reality. Now, is this just because Barry Long is a seven-centered shill, a shill for the mind, right? Maybe, maybe it is. It's interesting. It's like he randomly discovered certain truths, but then he's such a shill for the seven-centered reality, he actually gets the players backwards. Maybe, right? Or maybe he's using the words differently. Like the same way I said that the eliminative materialists can be the most yang people ever because they affirm that there is nothing but the material world. And yet the thing doing the affirming is the invisible, always superior mind, right? So they're putting the supremacy of the mind above the form. They're making mental decisions. I mean, all of this stuff is the, the yang, right? Um, so it's interesting. I mean, and a lot of things are metaphors for each other. I've talked before how the Rianne Eisler chalice and the blade and the return of the sacred feminine and stuff like this in Jungian studies, it can be somewhat of a metaphor for the, um, for yin, right? So yeah, it's interesting. It's interesting. But here he equates yin with um, the mind, but the mind is of the earth. So interesting. Yin, is terrest yin in terrestrial mind contains all possibilities behind appearances, all that can ever exist in the present and future, all waiting for the moment, the exact time to manifest in consciousness at yin's behest, precisely to yang's perfect timing, for yang is master of timing and sensory appearance. Yin, deep in the terrestrial mind, is beyond time. It is the principle of abstract knowledge attuned to the original spiritual idea of the earth. Yang determines the time at which any aspect of that idea within Yin's knowledge is released to rise and eventually make its first appearance in the human psyche as differentiated ideas and finally as the objects of the earth around us. So this seems like a very anthroposophical, theosophical kind of view of, and also a Platonist, spiritualist view that says there's a spiritual reality that precedes the physical reality and that things emerge in physical reality through the direction of spiritual reality. I mean, there, there's definitely ways of understanding this, like the Zizekian, Hegelian thing that says, yeah, the mind creates it and then you deploy it. I mean, again, like, like Reza Negaristani, you weaponize thought and you deploy thought and you create the reality using the mind. This is all seven-centered mind garbage. And I see a lot of it in Zizek's adoration of Hegel and I see a lot of it in the neo-rationalists. And, you know, so I think that's what this is, but I'm not sure. I just want to open it up, you know. I think that's what it is. But it's interesting because the narrative is so similar. Yin's knowledge is released to rise and eventually make its first appearance in the human psyche as differentiated ideas and finally as the objects of the earth around us. So, and he goes on, Yang is a principle, not a function, and how... So, you know, I, I, I want to do another, I hope to do another video on Barry Long's essay, The Draconic Tra Transverse, Yang and Yin, chapter 17 of The Origins of Man and the Universe. 
I hope to do this another time because it deserves going into to deeper sort of uh, close reading. But yeah, I mean, even just here, you know, as we're talking about Yang and Yin, I, I think I'll close now by just reading the, the lines that Ra wrote uh, poetically about, about today. And that's gate two, the receptive, right? And it's, it's the driver, it's the gate of the direction of the self. And we're in line one, intuition, uh, with, with the blue line being sensitivity to disharmony and atrophy. And what Ra says about this, so it's interesting, first of all, that what is the most yin? Sensitivity to disharmony and atrophy. Sensitivity to atrophy, that the yin has to remain living, and that atrophy is something that's become stale and dead and old and, you know, and all these things. So the yin is sort of always the, the principle of life in some sense. Um, but then the exaltation, the importance of aesthetics, whether inborn or acquired. Higher knowing through aesthetics. I mean, I love this. Like, if we just take this as like a fundamental description of what yin is, higher knowing through aesthetics, then we can see that James Hillman is like extremely yin then because he was being disregarded as an esthete you know, because he, he only, he had so much consideration for the aesthetic. And yet, you know, here we see that at the core of the yin, of intuition, of what it bestows you, is intuition is the importance of aesthetics, whether inborn or acquired. But the detriment is the assertion of ego in spite of wisdom, the urge for action that will ignore the wisdom of the higher self. So really the only detriment is is when the mind interferes, when the yang principle interferes with the yin. Yeah, that's an interesting one. Okay, how do you see yin? How do you see yang and yin? I mean, here I've given a few different descriptions of it. I mean, on the one hand, the design, the unconscious, um, you know, we can see Carl Jung is somewhat of a champion for the yin. And, and von Franz because they champion the inferior function through typology, so it's personal growth through sort of embracing, um, you know, that which is dispreferred by the mind, which is yang, right? And we see integration of the shadow and things like that. And moving on to Hillman, we see that Hillman, like his essay on the feeling function and sort of celebration of aesthetics itself can be a celebration of yin. We can see Hillman as being kind of Derridian in some sense and doing some deconstructionist technique. But we enter into lots of complexities because, you know, it's, it's clear to me that like Hegel is extremely Yang and Zizek is still in that Hegelian Yang mode of the mind is the all-powerful. And we see a lot of sort of neo-Hegelians, if I could call them that, like, Res, like Reza Negrestani and maybe, you know, Elaine Badu, even though they have very different views, of course but also just neo-rationalists um, and just most of, the, most of the contemporary philosophers out there who tend to be thinking types and who tend to be so much on the side of yang, meaning on the side of their mind. Like, I, I do believe that at a fundamental level when you start doing the human design experiment, um, it is equivalent to the integration of the inferior function in some sense or that that happens along with it. And I, I don't want to say that Jung you know, discovered uh, how to live your design, but I do think that the interweaving of the inferior function and the work of individuation is effectively identical. It's a description of what living your design is using a different vocabulary and, and without the precision of some of the diagrams and so on that we actually get in human design. So it's, you know, it's a different taxonomy for it. But, um, but yeah, I mean... I, I, and, and I don't want to conflate these. So I guess I'm just trying to say, just kind of to wrap it up, yeah, there's a lot of different views of what yang and yin are. When it comes to philosophy, it gets really complex because yin might seem to be the material, but then you find eliminative materialists, which are people that say that only the material exists, you know, but they actually are extremely yang in the sense, or at least I could say extremely not self, in the sense of making mental decisions, you know, extremely seven-centered, we could even say. Um, because the seven centered, of course, was the great Yang experiment. Can we become the apex predator? Yeah, we did. Um, so anyway, lots of different directions. This is kind of just a free, you know, free thinking. Please post your thoughts in the comments. I'd love to hear what Yang and Yin mean to you. Maybe we can, you know, differentiate some uses of the term. Um, 
it's also really interesting, you know, encountering very long descriptions. And then I also do think that, um, it, you know, independently, a lot of people, even if they are kind of shills for the seven centered or shills for the mind, um, you know, that, you know, that is keeping people from waking up into to living their design. At the same time, there are a lot of independent discoveries and not all of them are shills, right? Like Jung was not a shill for the mind. Jung absolutely acknowledged and kind of um, bowed to the form principle, if you will. Okay, those are my thoughts for today. Thanks for watching, everybody.